Thanks. Um, I'm Marty Downs. I'm the director of the Long-Term Ecological Research Network Office. And I have with me Evelyn Geyser, who's the chair of the LTER executive board and um, uh, a former lead PI. Uh, I, I haven't quite uh, gotten used to the fact that she's former lead PI at the <laughs> uh, Florida Coastal <laughs> Everglades site. And she's uh, she's agreed to go through some of the science of the network with us. Um, all of these slides are available through uh, the link that's on the screen and the, the bit.ly link. Uh, so feel free to grab that. I'll also drop it into the chat a little bit later. Um, and so what we're what's happening today? Uh, we're going to talk for a minute about who's in this session, both us and you. Uh, we're going to explore the LTER network, and Evelyn's going to take us on a little bit of tour of uh, her background and her role in the network and the rest of what happens in the network. Uh, I'm going to talk for a bit about how you can stay connected with LTER and what are some opportunities for presenting your research uh, either later this summer or in the uh, months and years ahead. And then we've got a good deal of time, we hope, for questions and answers. We expect to wrap things up in well under, wrap the presentation up in under an hour, uh, but we'll stay on as long as you guys have questions up to 90 minutes. Um, so you are muted. Um, that happens automatically when you're in webinar, but you can use the Q&A button to ask questions and you can also uh, enter questions into the chat. Um, we've got a few, it would be really good if I could see the chat as well. There we go. Um, we've got a few opportunities for you to enter uh, feedback through the chat function, just so we get a sense of, of who's actually here. So uh, my first question there is just uh, who's who is here today and and what are your goals? Um, so which which LTR sites are represented today? Can can you drop into the chat which site you're at or which site you might have worked at previously? Awesome. Santa Barbara Coastal, Northeast Shelf, Virginia Coast Reserve, Harvard Forest. I know they always have a big contingent there. Plum Island, Beaufort Lagoon, Niwot. And Evelyn's going to take us on a little tour. And by the time we're done with this, these will be more than just initials and names to you all. Um, how, how many years do you think a, a research project needs to be ongoing in order to be considered long term? And while you're working on that, what's one thing you'd really like to learn about the LTER network? Six years, I like that. That's uh, one funding cycle, says Kyle Emery. 20 years, says Noe Shapiro-Tamir. Okay, folks wanna know more about research opportunities. So anything five, 10 years, 20 years, awesome. That, that's a pretty good definition. And I guess it depends on the time scale of what you're studying. Maybe an even better definition. All right. So with that, I think Evelyn, you get a little sense of who's here. Um, Definitely. And uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Evelyn. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Marty, and um, welcome, everyone. It's so great to see so many names on the list and so many different sites. I love that. You're from all over the map, and how great. Um, it's great to meet you. I wish I could see your faces, but as Marty says, it's a better, easier format when there's this many of you to interact via the chat today and, um, and I hope to get to meet you in person sometime down the road. Um, 
as Marty mentioned, I'm uh, directing the, uh, uh, not directing, but but um, chairing the executive board of the Long-Term Ecological Research uh, Network, um, which is a collection of the 27 sites and, and the PIs from those sites that uh, come together and, and talk about research that's going on and how to facilitate um, the integration of that research and the programming across our, our different sites. And, um, my background is in the Everglades, and there's some pictures here of me out in the field. The Everglades, like so many LTER sites, is a big, expansive ecosystem. Um, and out in the Everglades, we have to get around by either helicopter or airboat. And um, so I'm sitting on the helicopter here that takes us to our sites in the dry season. We have a very distinct wet and dry season. And during the dry season, we just can't float our airboats. And the next picture, um, Marty, uh, there I'm standing in an airboat and I'm showing you um, in my hand there is the uh, algal mats that form all over the surface of the Everglades. And so many of our aquatic um, LTR sites have some form of algae that uh, becomes abundant in our food webs and, and helps um, regulate the geochemistry of the water. And you can see even in the picture behind me how much um, periphyton is out here at one of our freshwater sites. Um, and so that's what we study in my lab, and, and that's a part of our LTER program. Um, next slide. And this is another one of our sites in the Florida Coastal Everglades. Um, again, one of our freshwater sites that shows these algae mats all along the surface there um, in front of something called an eddy covariance tower. And that's a tower that measures the flux of carbon dioxide in and out of the ecosystem to determine the extent to which the ecosystem is either sucking out or, or perhaps um, um, contributing CO2 uh, to our increasing um, supply of, of CO2 in, in the atmosphere. And so, so many of our sites have towers like that. It gives us a chance to compare carbon flux across ecosystems. Um, next slide. And um, again, like many LTR sites um, at the Florida Coastal site, we have lots and lots of researchers that are across all the different academic stages, including lots of undergraduates like you, um, graduate students and, and postdoctoral scientists and faculty members. And we also, across many of the LTR programs, have uh, different agency scientists who we work with. Um, and those agency scientists are often engaged in decision making in ways that help um, actionalize that long-term data into uh, decisions that matter for the sustainability of not only the LTER sites, but the regions and ecosystems around them. Um, next slide. So again, we're just one of these 27 sites. Um, you can see the FCE down in, in Florida, the lower part of Florida on this map of the LTER sites. Um, our site was established in the year 2000, but many of them are much older um, and the, the program's been around for more than 40 years now, um, established in 1980. Um, each of the sites has a six-year funding cycle, and so I love that many of you mentioned that you think long-term data ought to be on the order of, of many to, to dozens of years, and um, the National Science Foundation that funds this network uh, recognizes uh, recognize the importance of, of that long-term support. Um, you might not know as new researchers that many grants that come to scientists um, fund research for maybe three years at the most five years. And that's just not enough time to capture the kinds of changes and dynamics that we know occur in all different kinds of ecosystems. So we're very lucky that our um, LTR program 
has sites that are funded on the six year cycle and, and renewed hopefully at, at the um, in, in between. So uh, across all of those different sites that are coded in the different colors there, um, we have thousands of investigators, again, from different universities and colleges, and including those agency and uh, non-governmental organization scientists. Um, we generate lots and lots of data, and the National Science Foundation requires that those data are made publicly available. So there are 7,000 data sets or more that can be accessed. And um, now it's possible to compare what's going on uh, from one site to another across this very broad network. Um, and we have many, many journal articles that you can download and read and to learn more about each one of these places. And we have such a wide range of ecosystems and biomes that the LTR sites represent. And on the right-hand panel there, maybe just go back for a second, I'll just point out that um, we have coastal and marine and freshwater and forest and mixed landscape, grassland, tundra and even urban LTER sites. So the next slide um, shows us, uh, yeah, the duration of um, funding uh, with some of those sites on the far left and the top corner, um, Niwat and uh, up in the mountains, North Temperate Lakes, Kanza Prairie and the Andrews Forest um, having been funded early on in the 1980s and other sites um, coming online subsequent to that. And um, you can see the different colors again, denoting the different ecosystem types and uh, that there were times when the NSF decided um, to populate the network with more sites of particular kinds. There was a burst of coastal sites in the early 2000s, um, particularly recognizing how much um, climate change is, is uh, causing change along our coastlines. Um, and then we also have urban sites that joined the network uh, in the late 90s um, and, and a new urban site just recently uh, to help us understand how urban ecosystems are changing in a, in a rapidly urbanizing world. Um, next slide. So uh, now I'm going to start a, just a little tour of uh, the different kinds of, of sites and ecosystems that are represented across the network. And I know um, there are so many of you out there probably uh, um, representing maybe each one of these. Uh, and this first slide is of the Palmer Station. And we do have two sites down in Antarctic in Antarctica. Um, this one is off the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, the scientists there go out on a great big research vessel and they they study how the uh, Arctic sea ice is changing in its extent with climate change. And um, they look at the role of krill and in in the food webs there. And they even study these beautiful Adelie penguins and how the populations of the penguins are changing over time especially with climate change. Next slide. Um, another polar site is our Beaufort Lagoon, uh, another gorgeous ecosystem. This one is up on the Northern um, Alaska coast and uh, researchers there have um, cameras that are underwater that help them uh, measure the uh, ice cover and um, document how it's changing over time. They also study food webs, everything from the little microbes to the invertebrates that eat them all the way uh, on up to the abundant fisheries in these coastal Arctic landscapes. Um, next site, I think we'll go into our coastal sites. Um, and here's our Florida Coastal Everglades site. Um, the pictures I showed before are of the freshwater marsh, but our ecosystem expands all the way down um, into our coastal mangroves. And so in the Everglades, we're studying how the sea level rise 
and uh, storms that are changing in their severity and, and um, frequency influence this coastal ecosystem that is being um, now restored. The freshwater deliveries are being restored through one of the, or the largest global, globally largest um, freshwater restoration uh, program. And that's very exciting to see how freshwater restoration um, is replenishing this really critical system. Um, on the other coast, all the way over in the Pacific, and um, in, the, in the middle, in fact, of the Pacific Ocean, we have the Marea Coral Reef um, LTR site that is in French Polynesia. And this is a site with abundant corals all over the margins of the island of Marea. And uh, there are su is such a diversity of corals and fishes, and the scientists there are spend a lot of time uh, scuba diving and measuring the growth of corals and their interactions with fishes and, and how those dynamics are changing with disturbance. Um, next slide. Uh, we go over to the uh, North Temperate Lakes LTER, which is in Wisconsin, and uh, the folks there um, study how changing ice cover and lake levels are, and, and um, the physics of lakes is uh, altering the underwater environment, and um, they also look at human activities. The University of Wisconsin is um, in the background of this picture and uh, they're in Madison, Wisconsin and, and that team is studying how the dynamics of, of this region are influencing lake ecology and um, the trophic dynamics of, of lakes. Uh, next slide, we're gonna uh, traverse into the forested ecosystems. And um, this is the Luquillo forest um, in Puerto Rico. And the folks at the Luquillo LTR um, have the opportunity to, to also study, just like we do in the Everglades, the effects of um, occasional hurricanes that sometimes have very damaging winds and affect the forest and, and the forest floor. And so they study those uh, forest dynamics and, and how uh, changing forests influence uh, stream food webs, everything from the benthic algae to the little shrimps that live in the rivers of those forests in the in the tropics there. Um, a very beautiful and mysterious site. Uh, the next um, slide is of the Andrews Forest. Now we're uh, hopping around quite a bit now to the uh, northwest corner of, of, uh, of the U.S. Um, in Oregon. And these are um, incredible forests that are largely shaped um, by fire. And we know in the recent years, the uh, Oregon, um, Central Oregon has been so uh, plagued by devastating wildfires. And uh, the folks at H.J. Andrews have been studying how those fires are um, altering the uh, forest ecosystem and many of these forests are old growth forests, a very rare uh, forest that has not been uh, touched um, or harmed by uh, logging and and um, often form a very important refugia for uh, organisms that like um, cold environments. These are uh, upland uh, forests. And, um, and so those organisms, of course, were very much affected by those recent fires and, and the team there is studying uh, the long-term effects of those fires. So um, let's move over to the grasslands and desert sites. Uh, the um, wonderful tall grass prairie site and the Kanza prairie. This is out in Kansas. And the scientists there are studying um, how climate change and um, grazing by bison and also fire, these prairies are fire maintained ecosystems, um, how those factors of, of uh, climate and fire and, and grazing interact um, to affect this uh, wonderful tall grass ecosystem. And this is a 
big, expansive uh, prairie that has many, many hectares of, of plots that are being manipulated in different ways um, with, with bison inclusions and exclusions to look at those uh, dynamic effects of grazing. Um, the next site is this, I believe the Savietta. Yeah, with the beautiful um, flowering plants there and the uh, desert grasslands. And um, here the researchers are um, focusing on the how uh, rainfall variability and, and changes in the abundance of rainfall over time with climate change is influencing the phenology of the plants in this region and the food webs and the ecosystems um, in this beautiful Savietta landscape. And the next uh, two sites, I believe, are, are human-dominated ecosystems. Here's the newest LTER program, the Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, metropolitan area. And uh, the scientists there are studying how um, the patches of forest and, and ponds, like you see here in this picture, are changing uh, in response to, to climate change and, and um, disturbance of all kinds, not only um, climate change, but lots of local uh, land use changes and, and invasive species and other uh, human caused disturbances. Um, and, and they're studying how these disturbances are affecting those plants and animals in the urban environment, as well as the services that these ecosystems provide um, to different kinds, uh, different groups of people that live in the uh, Minneapolis St. Paul region. Next slide is the oh, beautiful uh, Kellogg Biological Station, which is an agriculturally dominated LTER uh, site where there are all different kinds of scientists from agronomists to plant ecologists to biogeochemists and uh, invertebrate or, or um, entomologists who are studying how these different crops are affected by uh, different agents of change from nutrients dynamics or nutrient availability to uh, rainfall variability to uh, different kinds of pests that um, and 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 pesticides and herbicides that farmers have, apply um, and how those affect dynamics of these important crops over uh, the long term. Um, so that's just a little tour of some of the LTER sites. Um, and now I wanna get into the different kinds of science that uh, is conducted at these different kinds of sites. And um, across the different LTER programs, um, we have all different kinds of data that are being collected. We make long-term observations. Uh, we set up very large scale experiments that can be run uh, for a long duration to kind of tweak these different driving variables that we think matter and find out how they affect the different ecosystem parameters. Um, we also are a collection of scientists that work together for long periods of time. So we build these long-term collaborations, both within our sites and among sites that help us uh, make those um, critical discoveries. And um, expanding opportunities is part of what we love to do and bringing you all here today is part of that. Um, we just hope that all of our undergraduates remain in the LTER program um, into the future. And uh, so, yeah, part of uh, the point of our long-term ecological research is to uh, really measure that inherent uh, large variability in ecosystems uh, that is necessary for discerning how um, ecosystems are directionally changing with those directional pressures like climate change and other types of uh, change that happen at, um, large and, and um, sometimes local scales. 
and we also I like the last sentence of this, uh, which is about picking up those rare events and unanticipated ecological surprises. Sometimes our long term data sets have uh, we'll go along measuring something and all of a sudden discover something brand new that we couldn't have anticipated and only through uh, long term science can we pick up those uh, discover those kinds of surprises that happen in a, a way that we can't anticipate. Okay, next slide. Um, one way that we make sure that our LTER data is contributing to general theory and ecology is by having each one of our sites uh, collect data along um, the same five core areas of ecology. And um, those core areas are uh, basically the different processes and elements of ecosystems that make ecosystems function. And so if we measure all all these things, we can put them together and understand uh, the whole ecosystem. And if all of the LTR sites are measuring all of these things, we can compare our data from one site to another and make some generalizations about how ecosystems change over long time frames. And so those five core areas are patterns and control of primary production or the um, um, vegetation dynamics of ecosystems, the spatial and temporal distributions of populations and communities of organisms, uh, the third is how organic matter is moving around both um, over land in the water and how uh, soils are growing or um, subsiding. Uh, inorganic nutrient movement through soils, groundwater, and surface waters is a uniting factor across sites. And the patterns and frequencies of different kinds of disturbances is a really core feature of LTR programs because, of course, it takes a long term data series to be able to pick up the effects of particular types of disturbances, like shown in, in the picture there. Um, the next slide picks up our sixth core area, um, which was added a little bit further um, along in, in the timeline of our LTR network uh, to appreciate that most ecosystems are affected uh, by people and have dynamics um, that affect the services of those ecosystems uh, that, that are provided to people. And so our sixth core area that not all sites um, do, but but most sites do a little bit of is the dynamics of social ecological systems and evaluations of land use and land cover change. And this is particularly relevant for those human dominated ecosystems like our urban sites and the agricultural site at the Kellogg uh, Biological Station. Um, next slide. Let's see. Um, so just a little bit about the different ways that we collect information. And that first method is by observation. So all of our sites have these core data sets that are being generated in those six core areas. And um, we, we uh, measure those key things over time scales uh, that are relevant to the organism or to the phenomena that we're trying to capture. And we can see um, in this picture, this is the North Temperate Lakes team out with their uh, buoy that's out on Lake Mendota. And um, that buoy has a suite of all different kinds of sensors that hang down into the water and measure change on an order of, of seconds to minutes to show us how the physical and chemical and, and to some degree biological features of the lake are changing. Um, next slide. Uh, yeah, this is the Arctic um, Tulik site up in the Arctic and um, at the at the Arctic LTER, uh, they're also studying the effects of fire and they have um, plots set up where they actually experimentally manipulate uh, fire and other variables, but they also have had enormous wildfires that have swept through much like the H.J. Andrews and um, they're measuring the impacts of those fires uh, on those uh, Arctic um, tundra landscapes, as well as the rivers that you can see in the, in the background and the lakes that uh, connect to them. 
Next slide. Um, the Plum Island ecosystem where uh, the researchers there have plots set up, I think you can see their PVC pipes in the background, uh, measuring uh, land elevation changes and the effects of sea level rise on uh, subsidence in these coastal marshes and the, and the coastlines of uh, Massachusetts where the Plum Island ecosystem, LTR, it resides. Um, next slide. Uh, oh, these are the really beautiful kelp beds of the Santa Barbara Coastal LTER program. Um, and those uh, kelp beds are uh, changing in, in lots of different ways. Um, they're very much controlled by the Pacific Sea currents and changes in those current dynamics, as well as changes in the species of um, predators that, and grazers that occupy the kelp beds. Next slide. Oh, and the California uh, current ecosystem um, where scientists are out uh, in the um, um, coastal ecosystem off of the California coast and, and they use all kinds of drones, underwater drones that uh, carry all kinds of instruments that measure uh, the physical and chemical properties of the water, but they also take lots of water samples back to their laboratory and they observe all different kinds of creatures um, like this really beautiful uh, pelagic red crab um, that looks a little bit more like it's observed observing us as we're observing it. <laughs> okay. Um, another form of information collection or learning that we do at LTER sites is through large-scale experimentation. And um, many sites have uh, these really neat manipulative experiments going on that really help us isolate a particular variable of interest and control that variable in a way that helps us understand its role in regulating the dynamics of the different components of the ecosystem. And so I'll show you a few examples of experiments. Um, next slide. Oh, this is the Hubbard Brook um, ice storm manipulation. So the uh, forests of, of New England are subject to these massive ice storms every so often in the winter time and a severe winter. Um, you get a, a, a rainy um, event and then a, and then a freeze that uh, causes um, a whole lot of canopy loss and, and tree loss in these forests. And um, so the folks at the Hubbard Brook LTR actually manipulated an ice storm by uh, spraying water on a freezing cold night um, into the forest and um, then observing the long-term effects of that artificial freeze. Next slide. This site is well known for its large scale manipulations. One of the earliest um, whole ecosystem manipulations was this removal of a vast area of forest from a whole watershed, uh, a complete deforestation to understand the drastic effects that deforestation has on uh, both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. And there are really important papers that have been generated from this study that helped us understand uh, the devastating effect of deforestation on, um, on terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Um, next slide, they also uh, had a big experimental addition of calcium in these uh, watersheds. Um, these are ecosystems that were really uh, um, devastated by a whole lot of different factors in the 1970s and 80s. They were uh, um, one of the first ecosystems to show uh, very severe effects of acid rain. And so this um, calcium, uh, experimental addition of calcium was related to that uh, long-term recovery from acid rain, and they were trying to uh, accelerate recovery by the deposition of calcium into the watershed and look at the effects of, of calcium on uh, stream biogeochemistry, particularly, and forest dynamics. Next slide. Um, the Cedar Creek LTR um, has, thousands of 
permanent plots as well as experimental plots that they manipulate in different ways across what they call a chrono sequence in these old fields that are um, different ages. And they're able to apply these different manipulations, including um, nutrient additions, and they uh, add and remove different kinds of species to look at how species interactions influence biodiversity and um, in both grasslands and in forests. I think we might have a picture of their forest uh, manipulations. Next slide. Um, yeah, this is one of their, um, an aerial image of all their different forest uh, plots. So each one of these plots receives a different treatment and is followed over time at a massive scale, at a scale that actually matters to the processes that happen in ecosystems and that mimics what we might see in nature. Next slide. Um, I think this is another one of their, yeah, um, grassland manipulation plots from which we've learned um, so much about how uh, biodiversity manifests in ecosystems. And um, next slide, I think, is another one from the Arctic LTR, where they're also doing uh, large scale manipulations, um, where they're uh, trying to mimic effects of um, increased CO2, uh, increased greenhouse gases, uh, increased temperatures and um, additional nutrients and, and also fencing, I think is part of one of their manipulations. And they're able to do this um, by having lots and lots of plots that they uh, manipulate with uh, different controlling factors. And each one of those covered huts there is receiving um, a, a different combination of treatments that uh, they apply each summer and follow uh, those effects over time. Okay, I think those are the examples of different kinds of uh, large scale experiments. Um, well, LTR scientists also learn quite a bit uh, through modeling exercises. And um, these can be conceptual uh, models that help us think about how different um, driving variables connect to different aspects of the ecosystem. And they can also be mathematical. We can use the data that we obtain from our observational uh, long-term data sets and from our experiments that give us a sense of, of process and, and connections um, to make some guesses about how different parts of different ecosystems interact. And then we can tweak those different parts um, of the ecosystem um, and, and learn about what might happen if we change this driver or change this response variable. And that helps us make predictions about uh, how our ecosystem works, make predictions about the future under different scenarios, perhaps of, of climate or climate change or, or land use change in a way that helps us anticipate um, what we might see in our LTR data. Uh, next slide. Um, well, we also are very much dedicated in LTR science to uh, making sure our science makes a difference in the way that we protect and manage ecosystems. And so we work very closely with different practitioner, practitioners and, and um, including uh, tribal leaders, policymakers, news media can be very helpful in getting the stories of LTR science out to the public. Um, we have a really uh, neat project that links a number of LTR sites together, the advancing public engagement across LTRs or appeal uh, program that helps us uh, understand the importance of bringing different stakeholders into the process of both um, planning and learning from and adapting to the findings of long-term science. Um, our LTR science has shaped policy and practice at all levels of governance. And our LTR site is a good, ex our uh, Florida Coastal Everglades site is a good example of this, where the data that we um, 
interpret uh, from the uh, FCELTR is helping uh, make sure that we conduct the replenishment of fresh water to our Everglades ecosystem in the most effective way possible. And um, finally, we love bringing in artists into the LTR program, uh, everything from graphical uh, designers to uh, um, different forms of uh, media artists and, and even musical artists um, to help uh, depict the science that we're studying um, and, and describe the, the ecosystems that, that we study uh, to the public and, and interact with scientists in a, in a way that help, help us understand our ecosystems even better. Uh, next slide. Looks like we might have lost Evelyn there for a moment, but I'll pick up the thread until she gets back. Um, every LTER site has an education program at some level. They're called schoolyard LTERs. They have sort of different flavors at every site. Um, they almost always work with local schools and students, but also teachers. Many of them have research experience for teacher programs. They're involved with national uh, science, technology, engineering, and math organizations. They um, offer uh, on-site experiences. Uh, they develop particularly evidence-based teaching resources and activities, such as data nuggets. If you haven't, uh, if you haven't observed a data, data nugget, try it out. It's just a very um, manageable piece of real life, authentic data described and structured for use in the classroom. Um, and that actually came, that whole program came out of a postdoc at the Kellogg Biological Station. Uh, and it's totally uh, has a life of its own now. Um, sorry, I'm back on. I'm so oh, sorry. But thank you, Marty. You take it sure. from here, I think, if you don't um, mind. I think yeah, sure. Happy to. Okay. okay. Um, the, um, Oh, and thanks, Gabe. Appreciate that. Uh, Data Nuggets is in the chat now. Um, we also have a couple of cross-site research experience for teacher programs, so where teachers can go to sometimes more than one site or, or work on research projects that are applicable across sites in the summer. Um, and there's mentoring and training at all levels of education from, um, you know, K through 12, all, all the way through grad and postdoc. We, uh, Evelyn described many of the ways that we think about how our science goes together. We also fund those in particular ways. So um, the network office has small projects that support synthesis activities across the network. So working groups to meet multiple times over a couple of years and try and put data together. Sites have a bunch of activities to try and um, consolidate what they've learned about their site over many years. And uh, I noticed someone earlier was asking about the availability of data and Evelyn mentioned the many thousands of LTR data sets that are available. They are all available through the Environmental Data Initiative, which is just edirepository.org. Um, they're often also available through the site's websites, but EDI uh, or Data One is a much more, um, has a much better search capability. Um, so we're going to shift gears in a minute into how to get and stay connected with the network. Uh, but I thought it would be a good time to pause for some questions on, um, uh, on the last chunk of the talk. So uh, there were a few things that people said they wanted to learn early on. Uh, I don't know if you've got uh, access to the chat and the Q&A there. Yeah, Evelyn, but... let me hop into there. I'm so sorry. I cut out. I don't know what went no on, but I'm back. Um, let's see. Lots I, of I great think questions. We'll in most there. of them. Mm -hmm. um, so people want to know what goes on at urban sites. Um, yeah, there's some. Um, 
so we ha I showed you the new urban site, the uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis St. Paul, um, the uh, Central Arizona Phoenix site. I noticed there's quite a few people um, from that site here uh, today, and um, they are studying all kinds of things about Central Arizona Phoenix um, from how uh, water is being used and uh, um, changing uh, changing in its availability in this uh, desert ecosystem and affecting um, the dynamics of, of ecosystems and people to uh, the uh, wild birds that live in the herd of, uh, of, of um, Phoenix. So uh, urban ecosystems have a aquatic and terrestrial components to them, often in the urban sites. Um, we have scientists who are studying all the different aspects of ecosystems that you would study out here in the middle of nowhere in the Everglades. Um, and I guess mo many of the urban sites also have a stronger element of how uh, those different aspects of ecosystem function and structure matter to people and are uh, sustained by people and um, yeah, interact with the uh, decision-making of the urban environment. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions for Evelyn or for me before we move on? the motivations and goals of sites are really important to articulate in the proposals that we write to renew the funding for our sites. So, um, and those are uh, fairly easy to find on the uh, uh, different programmatic websites and you can get to all of those directly from uh, the LTR network uh, main hub. One of the things that I love is because the sites are, because they're putting in a new proposal every six years, I actually, all of those proposals are also available. The text portion of them are available on our website, but because each site puts in a new proposal every year, you get a sense of the, the sort of rhythm of how they dig a little deeper every cycle into how an ecosystem right. works. Um, really fun. Thank you, Zoe, for giving a really articulate answer to what's going on at Cap LTR. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Um, and um, I noticed Gabe just posted a few stories from our ne next website. Okay. There's a question about how challenging it is to get sites renewed. Uh, it's it's a lot of work. Um, the proposals are reviewed against um, pretty strict standards. Um, and it does, in fact, happen that sites sometimes do not get renewed. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Great. And I'm going to move ahead, but feel mm -hmm. free to drop things in the chat. And we've got plenty of time afterwards for Q&A as well. So, um, oh, and a few questions for you to add in the chat as we go along. What resources have you found most useful to your research experience so far at your LTER site? And have you uh, have any resources crossed your mind that would be helpful for future student researchers? And while you're working on that, I just want to say, uh, I know many of you are at individual sites, so you know how many other REUs are at your sites, but pretty much every site in the network has at least a few REUs and many of them have full on REU sites. So um, six, 10, 20 uh, undergraduates working at a site for a summer. And uh, those relationships that students form uh, so often turn into graduate school opportunities, career long opportunities, um, whether they stay in research or not. Um, there's lots of other ways to apply that science experience, but um, they do, they are often transformative. And it's one of the things that we are super excited about. 
So ways to find out more about what's happening in the network. I posted the, the LTR network website link in the chat. Uh, that is a great resource for information. And you'll, you will find all these other links there as well. The directory actually has, uh, it has information about people's research interests and is searchable by both their, their role in the network and by their research interests. Um, we have a, a very active Twitter account in spite of the tragedy that has happened to Twitter lately. Uh, but science Twitter lives on and you'll find a ton of information there about um, new papers coming out and job opportunities and um, announcements of activities and webinars. Um, the LTR community Instagram account is run by uh, primarily by graduate students and um, they every month a new site takes it over and posts a ton of pictures and stories about what life and research is like at their site. Uh, and the LTR YouTube account has um, has a ton of um, uh, boy, the whole range, everything from uh, student created videos or inspirational videos about the science that happens at a site to the the five minute lightning talks that all of our um, RPIs put on at the science council meetings every year uh, to the plenary talks that happen at our um, every three year all scientist meeting. Um, I highly recommend signing up for the newsletter. Uh, you it's just ltrnet.edu subscribe will take you to the subscription page. Um, it's got everything from those stories that Gabe linked to earlier to um, a, a DEI resource of the month every month to um, a whole range of upcoming activities and opportunities to get involved in research and job opportunities and publications coming out of the um, out of the network. Uh, you guys are going to get uh, a bunch of training at your site, I expect, on how to present research and. Uh, I'm just gonna offer a few ideas here for opportunities to present that work. Um, there are annual meetings of the Ecological Society of America and the American Geophysical Union and the Society for Limnology and o Oceanography, as well as smaller meetings like the Coast and Estuary and Research Foundation. Uh, they all accept student posters and um, you do have to pay attention to the submission deadlines, which are often a good deal before the meetings themselves. Um, registration can be quite affordable for if you're willing either to volunteer or to um, uh, attend virtually. And certainly if you, uh, if you submit well ahead and get the early bird rates for those meetings. Many of them have uh, travel grants and volunteer opportunities. Uh, for LTER meetings, our all scientists meeting is a huge event that happens only every three years. So unfortunately one was last year and the next one won't be until 2025. But almost all of the sites have an all hands meeting, a gathering of their, um, their scientists, their graduate students, their staff members, and those are great, very congenial groups to present, to just attend and learn about the science that happens at the site, even if they happen after you've left. Um, the uh, Many of them are available virtually as well. So check in with your PIs and staff at your site about what's available there. Um, Bio also has REU travel grants that are available. So you'll find the link here in the, in the slides. Maybe Gabe can post that in the chat. Uh, and then I've just included a bunch of ways to, um, to build your network, whether that's um, through ESA Seeds, the local um, chapters, and they run national field trips that are available. Um, SACNAS, the 
Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Hispanics in, and Native Americans in Science. They have a national conference in STEM every October, also with travel fellowships available. I want to highlight the deadline for those travel fellowships is July 14th, coming up really quick. Um, Advancing Indigenous People in STEM has regional chapters, scholarships, and a national conference and a leadership summit. And, uh, and NEON and the International Long-Term Ecological Research Network are all great groups to get yourself associated with. Uh, I'm going to pause. There are a few interesting questions, both in the chat and the um, and the Q and A. Uh, there was a question, Evelyn, about the difference between uh, neon and LTER, which you might want to take up. Um, yeah, I love that, and I see Nancy Grimm is there answering some in in a great way that this is. Um, you know, wonderful long-term science of different kinds. Um, so NEON is a coordinated network um, that of, of instruments and measurements at lots and lots of sites across the country. Um, the data are um, go into a central repository, much like uh, the LTR data, highly accessible information. Um, it's just a little bit different in a, the way that uh, the research is organized. Um, LTER sites are uh, um, come up with questions to address over the six year time frame of our funding. And so we're a community of scientists at each site working together to generate those questions. And then we work together across LTER sites um, to do synthesis and to figure out uh, what we're learning um, as a result of science going on across these core areas, across all these different kinds of sites, um, whereas NEON uh, is a series of um, different kinds of uh, data collection that is happening at each one of these sites, but uh, less uh, question focused and um, and and more focused on making uh, the same kinds of data available across a lot of different biomes in a way that is easily accessible for answering uh, questions that would be generated after, uh, sort of after the fact that would then be um, be uh, motivated by the data available. So um, they're just uh, two really. Um, wonderful long-term programs that uh, generate data in, in, in different ways um, for different purposes, but uh, there's also a lot in common and a lot of synergies that um, that uh, I think particularly young scientists can um, get excited about because uh, there's um, just a wonderful um, um, resource of information coming from the NEON platform that is uh, useful for interpreting um, LTER data and vice versa. And I see that Gabe also dropped in a great answer in the, um, if you have the Q&A open, you can open the answered column. Mm, I like that, That's yeah. Open column. Mm -hmm. That was a nice job. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, Matthew Steele asks uh, about opportunities and options to continue research once uh, continue the the research that he started on in his internship once that internship ends. Um, there are, of course, positions at sites. Many sites hire uh, technical research people. Um, even before they have graduate degrees. Um, there is uh, graduate programs, of course, and, uh, and also NSF has a, um, a newer research RE reps, research experience for, I'm forgetting what the P is for now, uh, but our year long research experience opportunities. Um, anything to add to that, Evelyn? Just chances to um, keep working on your research. 
I was reading down through the other um, comments. I'm sorry. Um, okay. But opportunities for expanding, um, yeah, research opportunities in the LTR network. Um, I think that attending uh, the LTR network meetings is a wonderful way to connect across sites um, and to other researchers. And um, the next one, Marty, is when? I know it's a while. 2025. Now, 2025. So it's a ways for yeah. you guys. A few years ago. Um, yeah. But it, um, you know, exploring different sites through the media available online um, can give you a little bit of a, um, you know, heads up as to what is going on in these different parts of, of the world represented by LTR sites. And um, each of them post opportunities on their websites and opportunities via Twitter and so forth. Um, I think perusing that um, and um, seeing where your interests lie and just writing, connecting with scientists from um, other sites by email, um, perhaps connecting with other students um, is always welcome. We love hearing from you. And, you know, they're um, over time or uh, all kinds of um, opportunities that come up. And once you've already made that connection, you uh, are on the radar of, of um, uh, different members of the community that, that then can let you know when there might be something available that uh, would be fitting for you. I should also <laughs> add, if you have not subscribed to Ecolog, which mm -hmm. is the blog and community for the Ecological Society of America, go do that right now. The vast majority of ecological uh, research openings are available on Ecolog. Mm -hmm. Grad student opportunities come up, technician opportunities come up, all sorts of things. So um, I would also say if you're at the Ecological Society of America meeting in um, August, that, um, and, and, and in fact, lots of our uh, national meetings, um, the uh, LTR network, Marty's office has a, a table and um, LTR scientists tend to hang out there and it's a good place to meet people and to uh, connect with those um, opportunity job opportunities that might be out there. Um, yeah, so come see us if you are in a national meeting, try to see whether or not there's an LTR table. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a great segue, Evelyn, into uh, so say you have the opportunity to get to a national conference, either because it is um, funded by your site or because you uh, took the initiative and got yourself a travel grant through a society or something. Um, have you have you attended a conference? Um, you can drop in the chat what sort of advice you might have for others if you have. Uh, and meanwhile, we will offer uh, a few tidbits that we think are really helpful. Um, just steal yourself to be brave and stick out your hand and introduce yourself to the person that you happen to be sitting next to. Uh, for those of us who are introverts, that is not a simple thing to do, but I always try and remember that um, most of those people are just as sort of quietly uncomfortable as you are, and there's nothing that breaks the ice like somebody else taking the initiative on that. Um, Try and follow up with at least one speaker I, after a talk or via via an email just to say, you know, you found something extraordinarily interesting about their talk. You have a follow up question. Uh, if you if you can't kind of manage the press at the front of the room, then uh, find their email address and follow up with them afterwards by email. But it makes you visible to them. Um, Go to the exhibit hall, as Evelyn says, talk to exhibitors, um, find out what opportunities they have for students, whether you think you're particularly interested in that or not. Um, read the news from the meeting, follow the social media feed for the meeting. People are going to post jobs, they're going to post events, they're, they'll post the 
sort of social hours that are happening uh, for various uh, constituency groups. Um, definitely visit the poster session. If you've had an opportunity to present a poster, then you know that the most painful thing is standing next to that poster with nobody coming up to you and asking you questions. So be the person that asks questions and um, you will learn about a bunch of things that you would not have otherwise. And you know, some of my longest professional relationships have come out of those sort of encounters at poster sessions. Um, meetings can be crazy. Uh, there can be just a, a ton going on. You're not going to be able to get to every talk that you think you want, that you think you need to get to, pace yourself, take breaks, step outside, um, sort of steward your energy for those um, for those conversations that really let you connect with people. And uh, that is all we have. The rest of the time is, uh, if you have any questions left, we're happy to take them. <laughs>